for making possible this inquiry and the discussion on architecture of the enclosed sea from a, between aquaria and marine protected area. I think I'll take this particular enclosure off. It's truly a pleasure to have the unique opportunity to bring together folks from the conservation and the political ecology communities into direct discussion with those from the history of design, architecture and art to explore these questions. I think we have so far seen from our previous day's workshops how much resonance there is between these two communities. Over the past two days, through workshops with policymakers, researchers, artists and economists during a field trip to Sagresh, we have been collectively exploring whether the expansion of marine areas classified as protected will serve to protect the life-giving conditions of the oceans. And we've questioned who stands to win or lose from these arrangements. We examined the question of protein through aquaculture and fisheries and marine spatial planning. Today we can see a dramatic scaling up of the marine protected area network through the Convention for Biological Diversities new decade of program under the auspices of 20, uh, 30 by 30, which presumes that 30% of the global oceans should be designated as protected by the year 2030. But despite this growth and the measurable success in the areas designated as protected, questions remain about the dynamic and contingent processes of establishing lines on a map, as the experiences will always be informed by the specifics of place, politics, a unique set of possibilities or closures. Lisa Campbell, the Rachel Carson Professor of Marine Affairs at Duke University in the US, joined us yesterday to talk about marine protected areas as having impacts on people, resources, and marine environments, which are multiple, complex, and specific. There is no singular story here. In ocean conservation, its effects and experiences is a layered mosaic that intersects with people's livelihoods, food cultures, wider political and geopolitical interests, historical processes, and cultural imaginations of the sea. The Marine Protected Area Conservation Technology is a spatial approach imported from land-based practices. But can this technique of drawing lines on the surface of the sea account for the flux of watery space below? To what degree are efforts to secure marine territories a distraction from the structural, economic, political, and material drivers of the Anthropocene, which are in some senses metaphorically the, the, the water that we swim in? It is here that the program interrogates the illusion of the boxed sea, lifting from the research and art produced in and through the Aquaria exhibition, showing here at Matt until September, curated by Angela Rui. Aquariums are volumetric indoor bodies of water. Marine protected areas, on the other hand, are aerial ocean territories spanning tens to tens of thousands of square kilometers. Both are spatial practices rooted in modernist worldviews, invented 100 years apart for people to know, manage, and experience ocean life. But we're here today to investigate what other common stories can be told along the scale variants of boxes that enclose the sea. So our program today begins appropriately with a session called Boxing as Method, which historians of science Susan Bauer and Martina Schlunder will present for us as an epistemological foundation for our preoccupation with boxing things. From here, we will hear from Mohammed Arju, Arju Hugo Werner Moniba Isaacs, about efforts to scale up boxed water under the new global arrangements for 30 by 30, which call for 30% of ocean water to be conserved by 2030, adding their research experiences of what this might mean in practice and why we should be wary of such simplistic and globalistic targets like this. Afterwards, in a panel with Roy Sargero Barrio and Samantha Muka, we enter into a direct dialogue about the geopolitics of planetary rewilding, such as 30 by 30, and the distributed conservation practices of aquarists who make use of miniature ecosystems as laboratories to support coral restoration processes in marine conservation. Angela Rui will then moderate a session that explores the backstage or the control room of these ecosystems, looking at the technical designs and the processes 
of keeping everyone alive in both aquaria and marine protected areas. Peter Chermayov, who is the architect of the Lisboa Oceanario, and many others around the world, will join in conversation with aquarium scholar and architect Carson Chan to unfold Peter's original vision for, the Lis for Lisbon's famous aquarium and its unique relation to relationship to marine conservation. And finally, artist duo Fraud will outline their artistic research that examines the EU's Fisheries Resources Initiative, showing that through historical colonial processes of the 19th century, which emerge today as neo-colonial continuations, the resource politics of marine extraction is a bigger story which highlights how ecologies are inherently political, historically shaped, and we would do well to remember this as the world converges over new spatial targets which are designed and promoted by these very same powers. So I would like to thank Beatrice at Matt and Marcus at TBA, who I hope is going to join us for an introduction in a moment, and also Carson Chan for his contributions to the program. So if Marcus can take over, and then I will introduce the first speakers. Hi, Martina and Suzanne. How are you both? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay. I can't hear you at the moment. But... Okay, well, it's very appropriate that we start our first session, Boxing as Method, with Martina Schlunder and Suzanne Bauer. And Dr. Martina Schlunder is a research scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Her research brings feminist science studies and science and technology studies into dialogue with the history of science and medicine, boxes and infrastructures of thinking, animal ontologies, ambulance science, and comparative epistemics are other focus, foci of her research. Suzanne Bauer is a professor at the Center for Technology, Innovation, and Culture at the University of Oslo. Her research draws from science and technology studies as well as from history, sociology, and anthropology of science. Her current projects contribute to scholarship on algorithms, biopolitics, and human-animal relations, post-socialism, and techno-science, east of what used to be called the Iron Curtain. Together with Martina Schlunder and Maria Rentetzi, she is the co-editor of Boxes, a field guide published by Mattering Press. I think we're going to hear about some of that book today. So I'm going to hand over to Martina and Suzanne to speak for about 30 minutes, and then we will open up some questions from the floor. So over to you guys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Suzanne, you uh, that's why most people virtually meant to put in quantum. Um, can you hear me still? I can, I, we can just hear you now. I think I, we, I didn't catch the first, first part of what you said, so I think, I think it's better now. Okay, so I try to recuperate my uh, Portuguese, that's a little bit which is still with me. Uh, so again, a bom dia de Berlin a Lisboa, e Susanne e eu, nós estamos muito satisfeitas por termos sido convidadas para Lisboa, mesmo que virtualmente por enquanto. Um, so we are extremely happy about the invitation to Lisbon, even if uh, only virtually for now. We are happy to be able to tell you something about our long research project on boxes and practices related to boxes. So we would like to very briefly introduce our book, which was published last year. For this, we will show you a short video of about three minutes uh, before we will talk in more detail about boxing as method. So thank you to Luis, to Joana, Inez, Neil, Tahita, and everyone else who helped to get this important event off the ground. Hi. 
published by Mattering Press. Boxes, a field guide, edited by Susanne Bauer, Martina Schlünder, and Maria Retezzi, published by Mattering Press, Manchester 2020. Boxes are about relations between inside and outside, inclusion and exclusion, content and form. Let's start with the content, the inside, as scholars mostly do. 39 authors in 36 in-depth historical contributions shift our focus to mundane objects, to the omnipresent but neglected things in knowledge production, cutting across disciplines, time periods, and regions. From petri dishes to medical bottles, from parcels to census boxes and cigarette packages, from black boxes to dropbox, from museums to refugee shelters, from buildings to text boxes. Boxes do a lot of things. They constitute inside and outside. They protect, store and separate. They make space, arrest or mobilize. Enclose or disclose. Categorize and abduct. Box practices also loom large in the form of the book, since it argues through formats, not only in writing. The book opens a new field, box studies, and serves as its first field guide. Its format invites readers to rethink taken-for-granted orders in scholarly writing and reading, and it's often invisible hierarchies. Each box essay begins with an image, a box taxonomy, and keywords related to box practices. By mobilizing elements of natural history, like taxonomies and identification keys, this book writes an impossible natural history of boxes and thus intervenes into Western epistemologies. We use the flock of box practices to generate bottom-up identifiers or taxa. Trap, juke, time, cargo, black, text, ice, anxiety, count, mirror, tool. These impossible taxa give rise to more imaginative engagements that help crack open academic orderings. They generate new connections and resonance. We understand this book as a snapshot of a process in motion. This book calls for perpetual reassembling and invites readers to create their own trajectory through it. What the book becomes depends on its users and whatever they do with it. Okay, by studying the relation of practice and materiality, this book explores the impact of boxes as epistemic and material tools in ordering, containing, and classifying the worldly mess. As naturalists of the 18th century try to order, contain, and control the abundance and overflow of nature, this book explores a cornucopia of boxes and box practices by mobilizing elements of natural history, like the interplay of images, taxonomies, and identification. And here you can see one example uh, of an 18th century natural history from Linné's famous Systema Naturae. In fact, the aim of our book is an impossible one, on the grounds of modernity at least, since it strives for an impossible natural history of boxes. Why is it impossible to write a natural history of boxes? Well, since boxes do not belong to nature. The modern constitution organizes the boundaries and borders between nature, culture, and society. What counts as life or as inorganic? Who counts as a person, as a subject? And what is treated as an object? So how are and how were these boundaries drawn? Here is an example of one of the most famous and influential box practices, an early modern example of boxing as method concerning the system of nature. Again, Carol, or Carolus Linnaeus, Systema Naturae, first published in 1735. Linné can rightly be seen as the father of modern taxonomies. His system of classifications and above all of naming served not only to build up specific knowledge about nature, 
but also emerged at the interface of the Euro European Enlightenment, European colonialism, and the emergence of a capitalist trade and world order. Linné was part of a network of naturalists who exchanged plants globally. Naming alone the main practice of the taxonomists served as a kind of coin in this trade. It served as com for communication and it was the most stable element in the global trade of plants, whereas forms and structure of plants could depend on local tradition. In a way, we can see how Linné's boxes or his names serve as a tool in value creation, a kind of bioeconomy avant la lettre. And while Linné's system of nature was soon replaced by another evolutionary biological one by Darwin, among others, his name, and especially the system of naming, have remained with us. The goal of an impossible uh, natural history of boxes would not be to establish an encyclopedic order of boxes. It is not our idea to simply add a history of the boxes to the history of the content, but to reflect on their interrelatedness. How do content and container emerge together? How are they connected? What relationships exist or are lost through enclosure? Whereas taxonomies are based on detailed description of isolated items, our intention is to explore boxes not as singular objects, but rather as emerging material that is enacted in very specific historical practices. We are interested in the socio-materiality of boxes and box practices. Thus, we are not interested in a taxonomy of boxes per se. We are striving for working typologies of box practices. Why are we interested in writing an impossible natural history of boxes and their practices? Because we want to make invisible things more visible. Western epistemology hides its rules, its limits and exclusions in its infrastructures of thinking, in the ways that things and thoughts, materials and concepts are ordered or boxed in by boxing in and formatting not being part of a critical epistemic discourse, by formats and narratives being taken for granted, like infrastructure's transparency. And I'm thinking here of very mundane things, for academics at least, like the order of an academic paper, the hierarchization of concepts and theories over materials and methods, and the anonymity of an introduction even in a multi-authored and edited book. Um, so in the Pandora myth, the opening of the box is the moment when all evil spreads over the world and mankind. In contrast, this book identifies the closure of knowledge production into the boxes and dogmata of Western epistemology as the true evil, as a true epistemic crime. In following Pandora's gesture, of opening a forbidden box, this book begins to lift the lid on the box of Western epistemic infrastructures. This book is about the ins and outs of a complex system, the practices of hiding, excluding, and hierarchizing knowledge in systematic ways. It does not work in the register of representation. It rather follows those who want to intervene in the fabric, the very grid of modernity and its ordering tools how to detach, uncouple, and disassociate classifications from the modern constitution, its universal claims, and its colonial past and present. How to bring taxonomies and boxes into different terrain. How to cross the shallows of the modern settlement and make an impossible natural history of boxes possible. If we understand the ceiling of the box of knowledge production as the epistemic crime of the modern constitution, what kind of epistemic wrongdoings, misdeeds, delinquencies, and transgressions do we need in order to open the box, to change the grid, to render different cosmopolitics possible? This book does not argue through new theories and concepts, rather it intervenes in a performative way. Its interventions are of the level of formats and methods. It pushes the limits and hidden rules of Western epistemology. 
what counts as an object or subject, as living or inorganic, as nature or culture. In doing so, it also serves as a user's guide to committing epistemic counter crimes by breaking epistemic rules, by contesting the boundary between the content and the container, between nature and culture, and by subject, subjecting the ordering device, the infrastructure of ordering, the boxing in as method, to the same rules that usually only apply to the content and the contained. The slapstick of our little and not so little epistemic crimes helps us avoid an iconoclastic critique. We do not mean to purge all classifications and taxonomies just because they have been part of an imperial, still hegemonic epistemology. Instead, we seek a generative critique that implies keeping present, that means not purging the tensions that have emerged as a result of historically contaminated classifications. Keeping the tensions between container and content, keeping the boxes open, allows generative dispute. The key question of a generative critique is then what to do with these wrong boxes from the past. In fact, this book is an exploration of the legacy and the future of wrong boxes. This book does not provide finished solutions, but rather wants to cut a path. The taxonomies of box practices that open each paper are not ironic since they do not want to ridicule Western epistemology. They do not want to add a little bit of playfulness and imagination to the iron rules of reason. Instead, the taxonomies move epistemology to a terrain where it finds its plural. Western epistemology still uses its alleged singularity to make objects comparable. In traditional field guides, for bird watchers, for example, for example, this is done by taking the concept of species for granted, hiding the complex histories and structures of this concept in its epistemic infrastructure. By committing epistemic counter crimes, by pushing against Western epistemic rules and norms, the book wants to transform epistemology into a field that thinks of itself as one box among others that makes its infrastructures available for comparison in a true comparative epistemology. Thank you. Boxes and boxing have been key to scientific practices and Western epistemologies, as we just heard from Martina. So from cabinets of curiosity in Renaissance Europe and colonial expansion of natural history, to 21st century data sciences and global supply chains uh, of the very life sciences. As to the enclosed sea, the title of this workshop, what has been interesting to us is this. The terms box and boxing also have a nautical connotation. Boxing a compass means to test and to calibrate the key orientation device in the open sea. In seafaring, boxing describes the rehearsing of the different compass segments in a standardized procedure with steps carried out in a certain order, one after the other. So this navigation technique needs a magnetized needle, a compass with a grid of compartments and observation of the stars. The orientation device, the needle, responds to the magnetic field of the Earth. The technique also features in this compass rose depicted on a chart of the Catalan Atlas of 1375 with the pole star as northern mark. Compartmentalizing and thoroughly segmenting the sea for navigation has been key to seafaring on the open ocean. Relating the compass needle and compartments is plotting one's orientation. Uh, in the otherwise unstructured sea and its non-categorized surface. Using concepts coined by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari in A Thousand Plateaus, techniques such as boxing the compass transform the smooth space of the sea into a striated space, a space that is covered and enveloped by a grid of coordinates appearing on a map. 
So with box studies, we are not only examining the workings of boxes and boxing within the history of science and technology, for instance, in navigation devices, such as a compass or the emergence of technical airspace. We also work toward adapted navigation tools for the study of boxes, modes of boxing and emboxment. We invite studying the epistemic orderings and politics entailed in box practices and to engage differently with the ways in which worlds are emboxed. In order to do this, we invite for further abduction and open up for intervention. And for doing this, we offer and propose some navigation tools. A first navigation tool we make reference to in our book and try to recalibrate is one particular box that has been prominent in science and technology studies, the black box. Opening the black box was originally a constructivist move to render visible hidden assumptions at the core of knowledge production. STS analyzed black boxing as a bracketing practice, an exemplar of the naturalizing and depoliticizing work of modern sciences. But studying boxes following Michel Serre can also shift our attention to thresholds, mixtures, transductions, and passageways, as well as to the social boxes we inhabit or take for granted. This redirects attention away from the cybernetic black box to the myriad ways boxes populate and animate relational spaces. So take logistics, a system of boxing and shipping the world linked to value creation and global capitalism. Boxing, naming, circulating things are at the core of economic relations. Indeed, if there was a science of boxes, it might be logistics. Its devices include standardized containers, but also box management tools like tracking systems and indicators that optimize workflows. Performance indicators have entered nearly all sectors of society, science and everyday life, corporate worlds, public services, culture and academia. Mundane and easily overlooked, logistics, data, columns, checklists and tracking devices combined with earlier forms of bureaucracy in infrastructuring social worlds. For instance, in air cargo, there is an entire body of regulation governing animal transportation, defining microecologies for transporting animals. Those live animal regulations are regularly updated and provide a species by species body of instructions for handling animals in transport industries. Our focus on boxing and enclosing here invites to examine these everyday practices of box orderings from the multi-species takeoff in animal air cargo, the usages of medical bottles, analyzing museums or academic texts as containers, or the box mediality of Zoom conferences. So another uh, navigation tool that we uh, propose is an experiment in formats. Studying boxes in their broadest sense and scope, we abducted and used the format of the field guide. And field guides usually help biologists to cut paths through the diversity of life forms. Experimenting with such an impossible natural history of boxes through the format of the field guides invites readers to think uh, differently about box practices and help examine tensions between orienting, ordering, naming, organizing, as well as moments of disruption and multiplica multiplication. Take, for instance, again, the regulatory classification used on the practices of animal air cargo, a classification that does rework the category of species by regrouping the animal kingdom through practices of handling them. For instance, a wooden box size, in fact, uh, matters. Note that fully grown giraffes cannot be transported in an airplane. Water animals cannot breathe, hence have particular needs when transported via air. There is light sensitivity, for example, in some tropical fish or airplanes need 
to adjust their departure angle during takeoff when transporting horses. And in fact, race horses actually are frequent flyers. So regulatory guides for animal cargo summarize this knowledge, and thus function as decision tools. In botanical and zoological field guides, identification keys are used to taxonomize and identify species within their manifold diversity, for example, based on their morphology, behavior, or habitat. In the field guide to boxing practices, we expose these identification keys uh, to draw attention to their modes of ordering, relating, and layering. We do not suggest a fixed taxonomy of boxes or any reference specimen, but rather expose the former to recalibrate our thinking about infrastructuring that boxes participate in. In other words, we performatively turn the field guide method inside out, exposing the ways it works in ordering the world. Thus, we are interested in the range of material relations that boxes enact and compel. In Deleuze Gattari's uh, conceptualization of smooth and striated space, overcoated space can morph back into smooth space again. Boxing practices can be seen as part of a grid that covers and makes governable ocean space or airspace, enabling not only navigation, but also further compartmentalization for extractive economies with layers of code imposed on smooth surface. Boxing and framing is accompanied by overflowing. Attempts to contain and govern can lead to spillover effects. Classifying and naming also is an act of claiming ownership and acting control. This refers to literal enclosing, including and excluding, enclosing and disclosing, but also delimiting and shaping modes of comparison, ranking, as well as the terms of trade. Classification also is an economic activity, an activity of valuation. Compartmentalizing the ocean or the sediment for extractive economies is part of and parcel of geoengineering, aquaculture, or regulating the sea for protection. Here, boxes and boxing practices also play a key role in those valuation procedures. The field guide to box practices is a beginning and a call for further box studies. We invite to examine the tensions and politics of ordering, testing and calibration, and engage in perpetual boxing as a means of speculating and intervening into orderings that go with box practices. To this end, we need more than a compass or reference maps as we know them. Instead, Box studies invite to recalibrate the grids of knowing and acting in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't, will you come back onto the screen? Hi, good to see you both. Thank you so much. What a fantastic introduction to this entire day and vast.